Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Russell Rowland for a discussion of his novel Cold Country with High Desert Journal editors Seamary Furman and Charles Finn. Um, we're running things on Zoom webinar, so if you're a frequent attendee um, from our past events, things might look a little different tonight. Um, the chat is closed, but you might want to keep the chat window open this evening. Uh, I will be dropping links to purchase books from Literati Bookstore um, throughout the event in that chat. And if you want to ask any questions for the Q&A portion of tonight's event, you can use the Q&A feature that's either at the bottom or the top of your screen, wherever the uh, toolbar is. And you can open that up and submit questions at any time. And I will ask a selection at the conclusion of the conversation. As a reminder, you can purchase Cold Country on our website. Uh, I'll include a link in the chat. And there is a link in the description below if you are watching later on YouTube. You can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com. Thousands of titles are available for curbside pickup if you live in the Ann Arbor or Southeast Michigan area. And in lieu of a book purchase, we also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So if you'd like to think of that as a subscription, whether it's to this week's uh, events or events for the month of October or events for the remainder of the year, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. So without further ado, I'll introduce our author and our, our moderators this evening. Russell Rowland was born in Bozeman, Montana in 1957. He has an MA in creative writing from Boston University. Cold Country is his fifth novel and his seventh book. His first novel in open spaces was called A Novel of Muted Elegance by the New York Times. He lives in Billings, Montana, and he's joined this evening by C. Marie Furman and Charles Finn, editors at High Desert Journal, an online literary and visual art magazine dedicated to further understanding the people, places, and issues of the interior West. Please join me in welcoming uh, all three of our guests this evening uh, into your living room by uh, clapping at home, and I know that in spirit uh, our guests will hear you, so take it away, all. Thank you, John. Well, I want to thank um, Charles. And, well, first, I want to thank John for hosting. I want to thank Michelle Dodder, my editor at Dezonk Books, for arranging this. And I want to thank Charles and C. Marie. Uh, one of the reasons I asked them to um, host this was because I am a huge admirer of High Desert Journal, and everyone should check out the High Desert Journal. Uh, look it up online. And I also wanted to uh, pitch their books. This is Charles's book, Wild Delicate Sounds, and it's just a fabulous uh, collection of short pieces about his encounters with wildlife. And they're all just so incredibly poetic. Um, and then C. Marie co-edited this collection, which came out last year, I think, mm -hmm. and it's called Native Voices. Uh, it's a very interesting collection. It has um, poems and essays, mostly poetry from native writers, but that she also included um, short essays after each of their um, submissions that are uh, that talk about the craft of writing. And it's very unusual to have that kind of collection from native writers. So it's, it's sort of a breakthrough book. So I wanted to give that a little heads up, give you a heads up about those those two books. And <laughs> should I read them? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. It was so amazing. this book, uh, Cold Country, came out in November. Um, it's basically a story about a murder that takes place in a small ranching community in Montana. And um, I, the part I'm going to read is just a short uh, selection from one of the chapters. Uh, one of the books that inspired this, the way I uh, structured this book, is called Death in the Family. Uh, it's a book by James G. It's one of my favorite novels of all time. And uh, the reason I love that book is because it um, tells much of the story from the point of view of a kid. His father's killed in a car wreck. 
And um, it's a beautiful book. So a lot of this, the narrative in Cold Country also is, um, it takes place from the point of view of the, the son of uh, this guy who's just moved to this ranching community. And he ends up being one of the primary suspects for this murder that takes place. So um, this little section I'm gonna read is from the point of view of the kid, Roger. And uh, I think the rest of it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, there's a character named Babe Ruth, who's a woman. So when that name comes up, it's not the baseball player. <laughs> Half of the population of Slack School stood on the grainy concrete sidewalk leading up to the main building. Midnight ghost, a voice echoed from the back of the building, and the dozen children took off running, rounding the first corner of the building, their senses alive for any sign of the predator children waiting to clutch them in their grasp. Roger lingered in the middle of the pack, plotting his strategy to wind through the herd of ghosts waiting to capture those who were still alive. When the children tired of soccer, they chose this game as the next activity. The rules were simple. One child started out as the midnight ghost and hid somewhere in the back of the building, while the others began at the front and tried to run all the way around without getting tagged. Whoever was tagged also became a ghost and was recruited to capture the runners of the next round until there was only one player left, who then became the next ghost. Roger loved Midnight Ghost. He was fast and nimble and was often the last one captured. The living children took a wide berth around the second corner of the building and Roger spotted the first of the ghosts who raced out from behind the old outhouse and captured Craig Kirby. Roger darted to his left, closer to the building. He was a mule deer, breaking free from the herd, his ears rotating, searching for sounds. He knew that moving closer to the building was a risk with the chance of being trapped against the back wall. So once he passed the first ghost, he darted back toward the perimeter again until Bobby emerged from the bushes to his right. Roger picked up speed, bounding past Bobby and then between two of the smaller ghosts who waved frantically at his narrow hips. Roger broke ahead of the pack and escaped easily, cutting the last corner so close that his sleeve brushed the white stucco. He leapt onto the sidewalk and did a pirouette, jumping into the air and turning around to see who else had survived. There were only two others, Larry Janko, who was the tallest boy in school, and Scooter. The three boys stood looking at each other, their breath, breath racing. Why don't you let someone else win this time, Roger, Larry asked. Roger smiled. What do you have in your lunchbox, Larry? What's for dessert? Oh no, Larry said, you're not getting my chocolate chip cookies. Then no deal, Roger said. How about you, Scooter? You got something good? Scooter didn't smile. I'll beat your ass just like your dad beat Tom Butcher. Roger's head snapped back. What? Come on, Roger, we all know. Midnight ghosts sang out from over the rooftop and the three boys took off like their feet were on fire. Scooter and Roger were both faster than Larry and they burst past them running side by side. As they rounded the first corner, Roger's elbow nudged Scooter. Scooter flung his arm out, pushing Roger off balance. He didn't fall, <laughs> but he had to reach down and touch the ground to prevent it. The ghosts had devised a strategy of forming a solid line across the yard. And when the boys rounded the second corner, their capture seemed inevitable. But while Scooter tried to fake and dodge his way through the line, Roger cut to the far outside of the yard and plunged headlong into the bushes that surrounded the playground. He ran with his arms up, elbows out, shielding his face from the branches, and he barged through the thick brush while Scooter was captured. Someone had raced in after him and he could feel them getting close. Roger cut to one side and leapt over a large clump of chokecherry bushes. When he found himself in a clearing, he ran. Roger ran for his father, he ran for his mother. He didn't know it, but he ran for Tom Butcher and Hazel Moses and Babe Ruth and even Arnie Janko. He ran for Rosa Parks and Chief Joseph and Ellie Wiesel. He ran for Medgar Evers and Martin Luther King. He ran for every woman who had had her feet bound and every man who felt a noose around his neck and every person who was forced to wear a yellow star, and every girl who was snatched from the street and whisked away. 
He ran for the centuries of human beings who had felt different and alone, trying to escape from the discerning looks and the condescending tones and the lash of persecution, his breath racing through him like a gust of wind. And even when he got to the sidewalk where the game ended, where he had won, he kept right on running. Thank you so much. Mm. That's that part of the book. Yeah. I think the game itself is so important. That they mm -hmm. are in his running. That's so good. Thank you. For having me here. And um, just a reminder to, to everyone who's joining us to stuff the tip jar for Literati. Because these, these events yeah. are so important. And the passage I think that you just heard. And and um, what we're going to talk about throughout this evening is, is these conversations are so important and we can finally have them with such a wide audience. It's just amazing that we can be in these separate places and all come together. So yeah, thank absolutely. you for me here too. Yeah, I, I, I ditto that. Um, what a wonderful passage you just chose to read and there's so much to uh, un unpack from that. But the, what C. Marie said, just to follow up on that, I'm imagining there's a, many people that have um, that have read the book already, but I'm hoping there's a lot tuning in. And because of just hearing that little bit, they're going to go and, uh, and purchase this. And, and yeah. please do it from uh, an independent bookstore if you can. And and, and tip literata. It's uh, a wonderful program they're putting on. Um, I don't know, C. Marie, if you wanted to start with a question, but I, I got choked up listening to that just now. Uh, this book, as easy and as much as a page turner it is, it's extraordinarily deep. And you do a wonderful job there, Russell. Um, see, Marie, I'm going to kick it over to you. I just wanted to give him that. I, so I, um, I'm so glad we've gotten to talk about this book like three times now. And, and in our conversations that just you and I have had as well, and the things that I've appreciated about it and still appreciate about it. And the one thing I want to comment on and hear you talk a little bit about is I, I've read, I, I'm Montanan and, and know Montana and have read so much about Montana and it's romanticized. I feel like you do a lot to, to de-romanticize Montana, mm. to show it, like to really expose Montana for what really can happen there. So it is beautiful and it is majestic, but there's a lot of pain in those mountains. And there's a lot of starting with the indigenous peoples and up until now. And do you, do you, I think this comes from honesty. And so asking you might be unfair, but how much do you think about the, uh, the landscape as you're writing? How much do you think about Montana and Montana as a character mm. when you've written any of these, including uh, 56 counties? Well, um, I don't know how conscious it, it really is, but um, I think when you grow up here, there's a natural um, tendency to use Montana as a constant metaphor for the relationships between people um, and just the relationship that we all have with um, just struggling to survive, you know. Um, that's one of the things I love about uh, writers from the West is that those, those metaphors are so natural and they provide for so much uh, structure in a story that you don't get if you're just, uh, writing about a, a s characters in a city, you know. Um, so yeah, it's not as, I don't think it's probably that conscious, but, um, and, you know, as far as your point about um, sort of de-romanticizing, I think it's more uh, demythologizing. Um, I think there's a lot of myths that come with life in the West and um, to, it's become very evident to me. I was gone for 25 years from Montana and came back and, uh, it's really clear after being gone that long that one of the one of the the uh, damaging aspects of that myth mythology about this place is 
that people are sort of expected to be happy and well-adjusted and self, um, self-contained, self-sustaining here. It's sort of the, the image that people have of people here. Um, so there's a very strong hesitation for people to, to ask for help, um, to be vulnerable. There's a lot of homophobia. I mean, the relationships between men here are really um, a lot more superficial than, you know, when I, I moved back here from San Francisco, so I was kind of um, stunned to see the difference. Yeah, and it's been hard to find, to make friends here with men. So a lot of that stuff is, um, I'm not really trying to de-romanticize it as much as I'm trying to break down uh, some of the things that I think are problems that um, need more attention. Mm-hmm. I think that's some of the layers that that Charles was talking about in this book mm. that really um, that are subtle, but they're definitely there. And I um, I think about the characters that I've loved most in all these books, and all, most of the main characters have been young men or young boys. Mm. And uh, do you think that comes? They're the they're the ones that that are still the most honest that are still like, um, you were saying that, that people tend to have an idea of what people in Montana are like or should be like. And so these young children through their perspective can show some of that complexity. Do you think that that and their vulnerability um, helps yeah. highlight what you said? Yeah, yeah, I think um, a lot of times we get it, um, not always beaten out of us, but sometimes beaten out of us, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, Um, and sometimes just um, talked out of us by um, people that um, are emotionally stunted themselves, you know. Um, In my family, there was a lot of that, and I think it's pretty common, especially um, in rural um, or ranch families, there's just it's just not common to, you know, I've, I've tried to imagine what it would be like to talk. You know, I had a lot of conversations with older folks in um, mm-hmm. Carter County when I was publishing my first novel. And there was absolutely no way I could go to any questions about, so did you struggle with, um, you know, depression or, <laughs> you know, how did you deal with um, the isolation that, you know, you just don't ask those questions for from those people, that, that generation. Yeah. I think it's becoming more common now, but um, mm. they, they express themselves through stories. And I love that about them, but, you know, it's limited. I mean, it, it doesn't get to the heart of a lot of what people struggle with here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a few of the things you touched on were, um, you know, addiction in the book. Mm. Um, definitely the relationship between um, sons and fathers. There's two very different relationships that go on between mm. characters. Um, bullying. Right. And, but you are Roger. Yeah. You very much um, modeled Roger on your own upbringing. Maybe can you talk a little bit about that to uh, throw people in? Yeah. Uh, so this story is loosely based on a, on a period in my life when um, my dad took a job managing a ranch um, that was in a, one of the most beautiful parts of, of this country. It's uh, right at the foot of the Bighorn Mountains. Um, but he was, uh, he was a teacher, and so he took this job um, managing this ranch that had several ranch hands who didn't uh, know that he was coming and they had all worked there for years and they're like, who the hell is this guy? And why is he the manager? (laughs) So um, it was a very awkward, we were only there for two years, but it was a really miserable time for our family. And we, we went to a one room school. There were 13 kids in the school the second year I was there. And um, you know, that our relationship with these kids was really strange because it was clear they liked us, but they wouldn't kind of let themselves uh, show it. So there was lots of uh, subtle, (laughs) you know, they didn't beat up on us or anything like that, but they were 
anyway, so that's this, I used that setting and threw in this murder to sort of magnify all these dynamics that happen in small communities like that, where, you know, you've got people that have a, a long established um, role in that community. And, you know, whenever somebody new comes in, it just sort of disrupts everything because there's not that many people there. And um, so that's, that's kind of what I was going for was to uh, show how a tragedy really impacts these people in a huge way, very bigly. Bigly. <laughs> Speaking of bigly, but not really, um, <laughs> I loved, I think it's difficult to write from a child's perspective. Hmm. I think sometimes it's hard for us, the older we get, to um, not bring our adult voice into that. And I have so many comments within the book where I just underlined passages and said, this is so like a child's voice. Hmm. So like a child would think. Can you talk a little bit about about how, was that difficult or did you... Or is there still enough child within you that it was so easy to, to bring that back up? And then to switch between that vulnerable and very um, just vulnerable young boy to these men who were, were not and were doing um, kind of heinous things and did heinous yeah. things. Uh, well, I guess it helps not to grow up. So, <laughs> no, but I have... You know, I have pretty vivid memories of that time. So um, I think a lot of that was probably just um, tapping into the, those memories um, of that and remembering what the, what it was like. Um, I don't know. I, I, I guess probably because it was such a, it had such a dramatic impact on me as a, as a kid um, and, you know, probably left a lot of a lot more scars than I would even like to admit um, that so it was a it was a time that I remember a lot of details about um, so yeah I, I, I suppose that's a huge reason why I was able to tap into that kid uh, voice mm -hmm. perspective right you know I, I didn't know that um, the, the AG book was uh, an influence on this one oh it, yeah, but it's interesting because uh, that that occurred to me because you're writing from that viewpoint of a child um, quite often. I know that Carver has been an influence on you also, and yeah. James Joyce, which I was very much surprised to hear. Mm. Um, can you talk about some further um, influences that you have in your writing? Well, yeah. Um, another is Willa Cather. Um, I think. Willa Cather and um, Marie Sandos, both both Nebraska women writers, um, they were, I think, f way ahead of their time as far as writing about the West in an authentic way. They they and I've often wondered whether it, the reason that they were able to do that was because they were women and didn't feel the pressure that a man might feel at that point in time to. Uh, fall into the stereotypes of, you know, having, of uh, avoiding the issues of, you know, Cather wrote about alcoholism and domestic violence and suicide and like all kinds of stuff that um, I think a lot of men writers, um, you know, they, they, they had that stuff in their books, but it, I don't think they addressed it in quite the same uh, depth of feeling that she did. Um, so yeah, she was a huge influence. And as far as contemporary writers, probably my favorite living writer is Louise Erdrich, or however you pronounce her last name. Um, I, I love her novels. I think she's, um, the way she uh, explores the West. Um, and, you know, she's native, but she doesn't always write about natives. She, she really has a, just an incredible range, so. I think that that's uh, that's his first reading. I know you read poetry too, and I think that affects a lot of the lyricism in your writing, and and particularly in that um, that piece you just read to us, where it goes from this small place and this race and this moment, and expands to cover every 
person or every ethnicity who's been persecuted. Mm. I felt that, that was a very poetic and lyrical moment and being able to draw the reader and make that believable. Mm. Because we are, that's coming from a little, a little kid perspective who might not know anything about some of those people. Yeah. Making it believable that, that, um, that all of that was embraced in that moment where he ran and he ran through that bush and he just ran away from all these atrocities that these ghosts or these people had, had put on other people. Mm. Like that, that the poetry you read really influenced that. And a lot of just the, the, the ease and the beauty of your writing. Mm. That's, that's not really a question so much as. as <laughs> well, <prose. laughs> it, it brings up a good point actually, because uh, when I wrote that passage, I really liked it, but I thought there's no way Michelle is going to let me leave this in. Because <laughs> I, I thought it went too far. I mean, I, I was just sure she was going to say, you know, this is, this doesn't fit with the rest of the book or I don't know. But, you know, like I got her edits back and I got to that part and she said, I love this. And I was like, oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the whole point of that passage was to, um, and as you sort of alluded to, um, to, sh to refer to the fact that, you know, it, it felt to me the more I, the further I got into this book that everyone in it, every single character in this book has a reason to feel like an outsider and it kind of made me wonder if that's true of everyone who lives in small communities, you know, um, that even if you're popular or even if you're one of the more respected members of, of a community, there's reasons to feel like you don't quite fit, you know, and I, I don't know if that's just, I think that sometimes, um, sometimes I think that's just part of the human condition, you know, and it's something we all have to learn to contend with. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was going for there. Well, you do that in a couple other points in the book where you, you, you're going along and, and all of a sudden it just drops into this very deep and important place. Um, the, the whole narrative tone changes. Mm. They're, they're very deftly done. And it links with that idea of your sympathy and compassion for all your characters. Mm. So it, it's it's one of the things that that made me truly in, enjoy the book. But can you talk a little bit more about having sympathy for all your characters? Because none of they have their faults and their foibles, and they're not really all nice people. But there's an underlying compassion that you bring in in every book that I've read of yours. Mm. Um, to all, all the people. And I think it, it, it comes from your compassionate nature yourself. But I, I do see that you, you really want people to get that in your characters. Mm. Well, um, thank you, Charles. That's, that's really sweet. Um, I think um, I do make an effort to um, think about each of my characters and why they're the way they are. Um, I don't, I used to do like character study, you know, write it out kind of stuff. Um, I don't do that anymore, but um, I guess it's sort of become second nature to uh, think about the, um, just to have empathy, I guess, is what it comes down to. I mean, um, I, I don't think any of these people are, are uh, mean-spirited or, um, you know, cruel. They're just, they're all acting on their own self-interests. And, and um, you know, I think that's true of most people um, with maybe one exception today. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just, uh, that, I guess that's how I approach all my writing is, um, and, and most of the writers that I've heard be interviewed about that kind of thing, say similar things, you know, that you have to love your characters. You really have to love them. Even if they're the most despicable people, you have to have some kind of um, compassion or empathy for, for them um, as to how they became the way they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Did you we've we've talked a lot about just everything within our lives and and I know that um you've been working on this memoir and I, I love that you put for sixty two years now. <laughs> but, um do you find that the fiction that you write is part of of a healing, as part of a reckoning of what you yourself have been through? Do you do you find that through fiction you're able to accomplish some of that as well? Hmm. You're about to do with memoir. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, one of the most um, fascinating. Um, questions that I have always tried to address in my all my writing is you know how does this place form the people how does it mm -hmm. shape the people that live here and um, you know so I've thought a lot about my own family and um, you know with my mom growing up on a ranch um, she has a lot of the qualities that um, have been handed down to me as far as you know having a hard time letting people in and uh, having a hard time expressing themselves. And um, so, yeah, I, I think a lot about that and try to explore it in my fiction too. Uh, you know, just trying to understand um, that whole aspect of the West, you know, how it shapes the people. Have you ever gotten pushback from any of your uh, male readers or Montana readers about the way that you've written Montana characters or written Montana or have most of them just kind of nodded and agreed, maybe even silently. I think about Judy Blunt when she wrote her memoir about, oh, yeah. you know, a lot of women would meet her in the bathroom and say, thank you so much for writing this. They couldn't say that maybe out loud um, mm. in front of their husbands, but they could say it to her privately. Have yeah. you ever, I really haven't run into that. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I've, I've gotten some flack about some of the characters that were clearly based on family members. Um, <laughs> that, that's come up a few times, but no, I, I, as far as the, the way I portray men, I, I, um, I don't, I haven't really heard that. That's, that's good. <laughs> um, Which if you're ready, um, Maybe we could put both of both the memoir in progress and this in conversation if you're ready to read from the memoir as well. Charles, Charles did you have another question? No, I'd like to, if, if we have a limited time, I'd love to hear you read from the. Okay. Memoir. Yeah. Uh, so this memoir is, um, I've been working on it for a long time. Um, it's called Be a Man. And the subtitle is Raised in the Shadow of Cowboys. Um, and the, the main thrust of this book is um, just trying to focus on um, how, like what I was kind of just talking about, how do we become the kind of men we are when we grow up in this place? You know, I've struggled with alcohol, been sober a long time now, but um, I struggle. I mean, um, I had a I had an abusive streak when I was a young guy. So this book talks about all that, and it sort of uh, explores some of the messages that we get in the West, especially in my generation when uh, Westerns were still big. Um, you know, one of the things that I point out, you know, I was watching a lot of Westerns to uh, as research for this book, and I I was watching the. Uh, Wild Wild West, the old TV show. And in the opening credits of the Wild Wild West, there's a guy that hits this woman and knocks her down. And I was like, holy shit. So every, once a week we saw this guy hit this woman <laughs> and knock her down like that's just normal. This is part of where we live. So anyway, um, this book explores a lot of that. So let me just read, I'm just going to read the, the opening, the introduction and a little bit of the first chapter. <clears throat> In the summer of 1986, my wife Jeannie and I flew home to Montana for my cousin's wedding. The night of the wedding, Jeannie wore a beautiful blue vintage dress trimmed with delicate blue lace. With her blonde hair and blue eyes, she looked striking as she often did. At the reception, we were standing on a balcony, our arms around each other when one of the aunts said, 
Well, it's nice to see at least one couple in the family still in love. I've often wondered how my uncle felt about that comment. Sadly, my aunt had no way of knowing the truth. We had just moved to Phoenix a few months before after a business failure in Montana and things were not going well. After three years of marriage, we had settled into a sad partnership, lacking in passion or joy or anything like the promise of a happy future together. Jeannie was 19 when we married and I was the ripe old age of 24 and everyone who knew us disapproved, but we forged ahead with the stubborn determination of youth to prove everyone wrong. Time had not served our purposes well. Later that night, back at my parents' house, Jeannie and I argued. I don't remember why, that never mattered, but the tension built and I slapped her. The moment my palm struck her cheek, our six-month-old son, Fletcher, who was lying on the floor across the room, let out a piercing scream. I had not hit Jeannie for a long time, not since before she became pregnant. So this scream was like a slap of its own, breaking me out of some kind of lazy trance. I stepped back, stunned by this audible indication of what I'd just done. That was the last time I ever hit a woman. Chapter one, six men in black suits. I was 10 years old, standing in a cemetery just outside Casper, Wyoming, surrounded by sobbing relatives and wondering why I didn't feel like crying myself. In front of me, my father and his five brothers stood in a row, the pallbearers at their own father's funeral. They all wore black suits with skinny ties, their hands locked in front of them. Six handsome young men, hair still black, all clearly brothers, and not a single one of them shed a tear. The year was 1968. My grandfather, Earl Starks Rowland, was a silent man. Not just quiet, silent. I have no memory of him speaking. I have no memory of him playing with us or telling us a story. I have no memory of him yelling at us or telling us to be quiet. I do remember one day being in the front yard of the trailer where he and my grandmother lived, just the two of us, him sitting in a lawn chair with a glass of lemonade, his forehead under his gray flat top, slightly moist with sweat. I remember watching him from the corner of my eye, wondering whether he would say something. The odd thing about being around someone so silent is that, sorry, uh, is the ambivalence about hearing them speak. Part of me was afraid of what he would say. So as much as I longed to hear his voice, I, also, I was also afraid of him, kind of hoping he wouldn't say a thing. And he never did. So I was confused, sitting at his fun fun funeral, wondering what I'd missed. Some of my cousins were wailing, heartbroken. I still couldn't, I still, I'm still not sure whether they experienced a different Grandpa Roland or whether they were just caught up in the moment. But I focused on those six young men in front of me, deciding that must be what it's like to be a grown up. Mm. Wonderful passage, Rowan. Thank you. Now, have you you've completed this, right? You've yeah, I just sent it to my agent a couple of days ago. So we'll see. How, when you, um, I'm really proud of you for writing this, Russell. I, I feel a little teared up because I, I've known you now for a few years and, um, and it's been a wonderful friendship. And I think that it takes, it takes a lot of courage to write that openly. And I, I just, I'm really proud of you. And I hope that this book will spark conversations between, I know you have a group, like a men's group where this happens, but I hope this book reaches a wider audience and sparks conversations about, about what that means to be a man and, um, and just about abuse in general and drinking and, and all the things that you explore within this. So thank you for having the courage to write that and put it out. Was, did you find that process incredibly difficult switching from oh, to nonfiction. And yeah, this, this book was definitely the hardest uh, yeah. I've ever done. And, but you know, one of the main reasons I felt like I needed, I have to do it uh, was because um, 
I have just, um, ever since I've sort of, I, w- I don't want to say overcome, but put that part of my life behind me where I'm not abusive anymore. Um, I've really noticed how whenever anyone, whenever there's an incident that comes up, they never talk about the fact that the men need help. You know, they're always looking at how to save the women. And that's always, that's of course really important, but it's, it always seems to be just sort of assumed that these guys are helpless, I mean, hopeless, uh, abusive animals and that they, there's no chance of them ever finding a way to overcome that. And that has always bothered me. Um, you know, I, and, and you see it all the time, especially in um, major sports where these guys get away with it and they don't get help. You know, they, they talk about anger management and of course that's good too, but um, I don't think they grasp. I mean, it, it's a long, it took me years of therapy to come to terms with why that anger was so, my anger was so um, explosive and came, seemed to come out of nowhere and I couldn't figure out why uh, and, and what to do about it. And it took a long time. It took a long time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, putting someone in a class about anger management for a month is not going to cut it. Right. Yeah. One, one of the things I'm learning, um, Russell, and I don't know you nearly as well as C. Marie does, um, but that through all these, these hardships that you've been through during your life, you've taken them and turned them into art and turn them into a, a positive mm-hmm. things and you haven't become bitter and I think that's a lot of the attraction to your work mm. is that again there's that huge um, sympathy that comes through now and I'm, I'm trying to find a way a way into this but um, do you did, did your characters ever uh, lead you in directions you weren't expecting. Oh, yeah. I know you don't write from an outline. I know you don't put it all out and then fill in the blanks. But um, were you, are you one of the writers that, you know, a character just starts going this direction and you're like, well, I guess I got to go there. Yeah, absolutely. That's always been my approach to all my fiction. And um, I love that about writing fiction, actually. I think it's um, really um, wonderful to have these mistakes and you know um, you know you go down one path and you end up in a rabbit hole that you can't find your way out of and so maybe you have to start (laughs) start that whole sequence over so yeah I I think that's um, uh, every time I've tried to control a storyline it it, you know it just it smothers it I mean there's no life to it so I think that's for me, that's the only way. That's the only way that works. And it, of course, it means a lot of editing, but I'm happy. To, I'm happy to do that. I like the editing process. So yeah, I, I did slip back into um, cold country, but how about that process with the memoir? Did it take you places where you were oh. like, "Holy shit!" Mm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I wasn't really thinking about doing, but ended up doing was um, sort of going back further into Montana's history and like the legacy of violence. Um, you know, because I, I couldn't, I just, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, why are these, why are a lot of these behaviors considered okay? And, and you know, when you think about the vigilantes and how they're glorified, even though when you read the real story, I mean, these guys were, they had good intentions at first, but they ended up being <laughs> complete criminals. I mean, they were they were kind of like the proud boys of today, basically. Mm-hmm. They armed themselves, went out, and got these, um, you know, killed these criminals. But I mean, that very same night after they hung Harry Plum, Henry Plummer, they killed this Mexican guy just because nobody liked him. Mm-hmm. That was that was the you know it, it went from you know a, an act of social justice to okay who else can we take care of while we're at it and um, 
it went like that, you know, just in a matter of hours. <laughs> so it's, you know, that that's fascinating to me. And, it, and I think it, the fact that that part of the story gets brushed over and people still talk about the vigilantes like that was some kind of noble cause is, is, is frightening. And, you know, it's false. So the highway yeah. patrol still has the seven, seven. They're bad. Yeah. 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 Which is, that's really interesting to think about that they still hold that as something that they would iconically use. Yeah. So, Glorified. Yeah. To glorify. Yeah. 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 Any trip to Virginia city is not fulfilled unless you've seen where they've hung everyone. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of those guys that were part of the vigilantes ended up becoming governors and, you know, <laughs> um, you know statesmen in, in Montana. So that, that's pretty interesting too. <laughs> it had a pretty huge impact on our, the way that we looked at ourselves. Right. Right. Your subtitle um, about cowboys, what was hmm. growing up? Can you read the subtitle again? To Ray, be raised in the shadow of cowboys. That's, that's pretty, I mean, we talk all night about that and how complicated <laughs> that is when we think of Calvin Bundy, when we think of anyone that puts on a cowboy hat, either the right or wrong way, when they try to make a speech about land, hmm. um, about and Bundy here in my state with his he's yeah. out and unmasking and causing football games to shut down. Right. Each of your characters, of course, um, In Open Spaces was the book that introduced me to you and like started me fangirling you and all that kind of stuff. But um, none of your characters turn out to be cowboys. Yeah, well. Are uh, push against that even if they grow up rural or they grow up on ranches yeah well you know save them when it comes to the whole image of a cowboy that's one of the things that um, I talk about a lot um, that whole image was created I think because I read a lot of the history of Montana and in, in memoirs too of written by guys that were in the early when the state was first coming out into being and they they're not shut down they're not stoic um they talk about the how much they love other men and stuff like that and so i i've always wondered well where did that shift happen and i believe my theory is the virginian started the whole thing this book is um the main character is doesn't have a name he comes from back east and he shows up and he's like completely uh, master at shooting and roping and you know he's like he's totally John Wayne and Clint Eastwood um, and, it, and the guy that wrote that book was from Boston <laughs> you know he was a law school guy a friend of Teddy Roosevelt's so this this image was created by an outsider and I think it's been perpetuated by outsiders uh, ever since you know and uh, mm -hmm. that's one of the things I really wanted to talk about in this book was you know, we, we, we can't accept this as fact. It's not true. We're not, we're human beings, you know, we're not these, um, trying to live up to the image of these um, stoic, like guys that can do everything. And, you know, you notice John Wayne and Clint Eastwood are never married in any of their movies. I mean, <laughs> who mm -hmm. wants that? <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyway, I'm preaching now. <laughs> so, I mean, you have a great following for preaching. And that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's also the writing that you do on a daily basis that's informative and that kind of does this check of what's going on politically and locally and, and even within um, popular media. I think it's hugely important. I look at mm -hmm. I read your posts and I look at likes and stuff on, on Facebook and Three, four hundred people. So your voice is obviously, your preaching is obviously yeah. being received. I just want to remind people again that there's the virtual tip jar out there for literati books. Yeah. So if you're please, please enjoying this, contribute to yeah. literati for yeah, your, yeah. In lieu of that ten dollar cocktail you could be buying right now, you can put <laughs> dollars in the tip jar for literati. Yeah. Charles. 
Um, well, we were talking cowboys, um, and I, I, you don't have any, uh, and this is really, seem we're probably more up your alley, but, um, you know, writing from the native perspective. Mm. And I do believe you're at least partly into a work where you're trying to write from that, <laughs> which is, as you said, just write for pitfalls and you know, people coming back at you. But um, yeah. talk, talk a little bit about that and the process and the struggle you're having and um, your thoughts on it. Well, yeah, it's, um, I'm, I'm just going to very briefly talk about that because it's, it's very complicated. But yeah, one of the main characters in my new novel is, is a native um, kid, actually the narrator. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really treading into uh, the whole, um, what's the word? Um, help me out here. Appropriation mm -hmm. issue. And, um, you know, I, I, I and a lot of writers I've talked to think that that's, um, it's important to acknowledge that um, Native voices are not represented as well as they should be and Native writers should be published more. Um, but I don't think limiting what the rest of us write about is, is, is should be part of that conversation. So, uh, but I, I'm trying to um, utilize the, the resources I have. I have a lot of Native friends, including C. Marie and um, to get the get it right, and to me, that's that's the most important thing is um, trying to get it right. So we'll see how that goes. I'm still early on, so we'll see. Hmm. I know that the Q and A box is starting to fill up. Um, Charles, are you are you ready to turn it back over? Sure. Awesome. Thank you both um, for your questions for Russell so far and, and, and Russell for, for sharing your work with us um, and all for such a lovely conversation. Um, we do have some questions. Um, the first one is, um, is touches on something I think Russell was talking about a, a bit earlier. Um, the viewer writes, and lots of your writing accentuates the male ethos of Montana. Do you think these manhood demands come organically from within the state or in fact, are they at least partially imposed from outside the state? Mm. Examples might be icons like the Marlboro Man, practices like uh, advertises, advertising snooze products at rodeos. Yeah. Alcohol is rather mythologized. Yeah. Montana and Helena have high rates of military participation also. Is that part of the imperative for a kind of Montana style manhood expectation? And does national money play into Montana's self image? So I guess a question about the what's yeah. what's in the Mon intra Montana and what's sort of supra Montana about about yeah well manhood. I think um, the the answer to that question is that the the cowboy the Montana cowboy the or the Western cowboy has become a a role model for um, a lot of things um, not just Western um, ethos but um, you know, the, this idea that one guy can come in and fix things uh, is not just a Western myth anymore. It's, it's kind of the, the, it happens a lot in politics too, you know. Um, the savior, the, the white savior is going to come and fix everything. And so, yeah, I think it's been um, perpetuated throughout um, our history by movies and, and television where, you know, things are wrapped up in half an hour. Um, it's, it's just not a very realistic view of, of the world. And, and uh, yeah, I definitely think it's been influenced by outside forces for sure. Thank you. Um, have your rights and you make it sound so real when Roger becomes the deer, the rabbit, the eagle throughout the book. Uh, was enriching our own imagination an important part of the story you wanted to convey? Yeah, well, um, that whole aspect of D Roger's personality was um, his way of trying to escape the reality of uh, what was happening. And, and I think a lot of us do that. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of us do it by going out into nature, too. So, yeah. Um, someone writes in wanting to know if there are other family members that are writers. Mm. Uh, 
You know, not so far. Um, and there weren't really any before me either. Uh, although my uncle, uh, I have an uncle who just passed away about three years ago who wrote a memoir and I'm, I <coughs> helped him on that. So um, I guess there is that, but yeah, nobody else that's pursued it as a career. Thank you. And there, there's just a couple other comments here as well. Um, thanking you for, for your honesty and bravery and, and for um, learning that your childhood experiences influenced this beautiful story and that you based Roger um, on a true moment of your life. Um, people thanking you for, for sharing tonight. Um, we're reaching the top of the hour, but I, I do want to ask a question to all three of you, which is sort of the um, common question that we ask at all of our events at Literati. Um, and that's, um, if you have any recommendations for, for further reading, um, I know we, we put links in the chat as well for, mm. for wild, delicate sounds for native voices and for cold country. You can purchase all of those from the variety bookstore, but we always like to hear, of course, I know that during these really strange times, I have a big pile of books on my bedside table. That's just mm -hmm. collecting dust. But, um, if you have any, anything you want our, our, our viewers to know about or think about before we go, um, we're always happy to hear. I would like to uh, recommend a friend of mine who just doesn't get enough attention. Um, his name is uh, Alan Jones, and he's written some amazing Montana novels, my favorite of which is A Bloom of Bones. Um, and he, he's just uh, very, um, his pose is po poetic, but he's also really good at plot. And um, so, that would be my one. How about you guys? I think that to continue the conversation with what you're writing, Betsy Quammen's American Zion mm. is an amazing, amazing book and um, one that people should look into. And I think that Kim Barnes has done a lot yeah. of writing about the male Wests and any of her books that you, that you pick up are gonna be amazing. And um, I think the next book that she puts out is going to be absolutely stunning. So um, keep your eye on Kim Barnes. And if you haven't read Kim, do. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I I'd mentioned that C. Marie has a chapbook, Camp Beneath the Dam of Poetry, that is um, still mm. quite outstanding. I don't know, C. Marie, if you how many copies is are it out? out? Can that is it out? It came out. Pandemic came out, so I was I was you know head to head with a quarantine. So quarantine one. Oh, <laughs> chat hooked in, which is yeah, yeah. Charles, thank you. Charles, don't you have one coming out? Yes, um, it, it's a book of my poetry paired with um, black and white landscape photographer photography yeah. from a good good friend who's a wonderful photographer. Walker Evans. Is that yeah. it? Don't I wish? Don't I wish? <laughs> Um, but uh, somebody keep on your radar, um, Joe Wilkins. Uh, he was oh, the, editor, okay. the nonfiction editor before C. Marie, and he is just hands down great. Um, poetry, fiction, nonfiction. Mountains and Fathers is a, is a wonderful book of his. Um, I love that book, yeah. Um, yeah, remember that name, Joe Wilkins. Yeah. Well, thank you um, for those recommendations. Um, you can find those books, some of those books, and of course, all of our, our uh, Russell's books and and Charles and C. Marie's books uh, at our website as well. And there are links in the chat, and there will be links in the description below if you're watching us on YouTube. Um, but we've reached the the top of the hour. So, Russell Rowland, C. Marie Freeman, Charles Finn, thank you so so much for for a really uh, wonderful conversation this evening, and for being part of um, At Home with Literati, and for allowing us to fold the map from the West to the Midwest this mm -hmm. evening. Um, we really appreciate it. And to all, all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us as well. And we, can, we hope you continue to stay safe and, and be well. Um, and hope to see you in the bookstore very soon. But until then, um, take care, everybody. Thank you, John. And thanks, C. Marie and Charles. Thank you, Russell. Thanks, John. Thanks, thanks guys. John. Take care, all. <laughs>